What's up guys? Today we're taking a look at how you can bend a ZBrush to your will to make fluffy sweaters. Let's go. Hey guys, I'm Eric and today we're going to take a look at micro poly and nano mesh. These are two super useful features in ZBrush that allow you to make very small detail or highly repeated detail in a very quick and efficient manner. Each of them do a very similar thing, but they have their strengths and their weaknesses. And we're going to take a look at how you use each one and when you might use each one. So these are great for things like chainmail, scales, adding small detail to cloth, even just scattering stuff on like a terrain. They have a lot of different uses. And the great thing about these is once you know they exist and how they work, they kind of re frame how you think about making stuff in ZBrush. So something that was once a very time consuming and monotonous task is now something that you can quickly do, iterate on and preview in a very short amount of time. So let's not waste any more time. Let's go ahead and jump in and take a look at MicroPoly. First thing we're gonna do, just so we have a more practical example, is quickly make a shirt for this orc right here. So I'm just gonna mask off a shirt, extract it, and then zero mesh and smooth it out to kind of get it into a nice, easy to use shirt that has clean geometry. So I'm just zero meshing it. I'm gonna use my smooth brush to smooth it out. And then I'm gonna zero mesh it a couple more times just to simplify the geometry. And then we can start building our micro poly on top of this. I'm just going to inflate the shirt so it's covering his entire body and just making sure it's clear of any colliding geometry. To give you a brief explanation of what MicroPoly is, it's basically a method to take a mesh and replace each quad with a different subtool or what's called a MicroPoly. So you're basically replacing a quad one for one with a different model. This allows you to take a model and spread it across an entire surface because you're populating all of the quads with this new model. And so having said that, that means that MicroPoly is very dynamic. You can subdivide or go back down your subdivision chain and MicroPoly will update based on how many polygons you have. So the more you subdivide, the more detail your MicroPoly is going to have. The less you subdivide, the less detail. So it's very flexible with what you want to do. And knowing that it's dynamic will help us understand why MicroPoly is where it is. So if we go to our geometry menu and we go to dynamic subdiv, you'll see that there's a MicroPoly section. And in order to get that MicroPoly section, we have to go ahead and enable dynamic subdiv. So you hit that button and then the MicroPoly section will be there for you to play with. We're gonna go ahead and turn MicroPoly on. And when you turn MicroPoly on, you'll see it's gonna bring this pop-up up of a whole bunch of different MicroPolys or subtools that we can then use and apply to our mesh. So we're gonna choose Chainmail 02 and see what that does. You can see once I chose that Chainmail, our entire mesh updated with this new Chainmail. The first thing you'll notice is some issues. You can see that it's not really lining up right and we're getting some really weird shapes. And so you have a couple different tools that you can use to adjust your micro poly. The first one we're going to hit is a line. That's going to attempt to line everything up and be more uniform. Now, you'll notice where our symmetry line is. The micro poly is not really lining up. And that is something I've noticed is that it doesn't always work well with symmetry. So all I'm going to do is disable micro poly and run a Z remesh with symmetry off on my model to get rid of that symmetrical line down the middle. And then I'm going to re-enable micro poly. After I re-enable it, I'm going to hit align and you can see that everything's lining up much better now. Now you will notice some areas will still struggle to align with micro poly and that's because micro poly is extremely dependent on your topology. So the way your edges are flowing and the way your polys are flowing are all going to determine how it lines up. You might have some areas that don't line up perfect and depending on your pattern, like if this is just a cloth weave pattern, it's going to be so small that it won't really matter. But if it is like chain mail, you might have to kind of play with the flow of your mesh to try and get it to work. Now, I do recommend if you can break up your surface. So like if our chain mail had a seam down the edge or down the arms that we could then break this into multiple meshes. It's going to be much easier to align your micro poly than trying to get the whole thing perfectly linked up. You can do it. It's just going to take a bit of finagling. Now you can see if we subdivide, the micro poly is updating based on our subdivision level. So as we go higher in our subdivs, we're getting more detail from our micro poly. That's because our quads are getting smaller and it's matching the amount of quads we have. It'll update. Now I have noticed sometimes when I step back down, the micro poly doesn't immediately update. All you need to do is just toggle micro poly real quick and it'll update 
Um, this doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes. So just if you notice it not updating to your subdiv, just toggle it on and off and it should be fine. Now, the power of Micropoly is that it's a preview. So what we're seeing is still being driven by that mesh that we originally had of the shirt. So any changes you make are affecting that original mesh. And then the Micropoly preview is updating to accommodate those changes. So we can continue to go in and sculpt and modify this shirt, add wrinkles, do whatever we want to do. And then we can just turn on Micropoly and see those changes. You can even do it with Micropoly on and it's acting like that original mesh. This is super powerful because it's fast and it doesn't really slow down your machine. And you can do really big changes and kind of see how that Micropoly is reacting. Here's an example where we're just swapping out that chainmail for a weave. And you can see how easy it is to kind of preview different micropolys, different details, and kind of see what works for your model. So it's very non-destructive and it's very easy to iterate on. The other two settings to keep in mind with micropoly is fit and weld. Fit will just make sure that the Micropoly is conforming to your quads because most likely the quads on your model are not perfectly uniform. And so by turning on fit, it's going to conform those to your non-uniform quad. The other button, weld, is going to make sure that your micropolys are welding to each other along your surface. So if you have edges like the chainmail where the links are meant to merge together, Weld is just going to make sure that happens. If you had weld off and you turned your micropoly to geo and you try to smooth, you're going to see there's going to start to be gaps because it's opening up those areas. So welding is just going to make sure that everything is connected. Now you can also make your own micropolys and you can also preview how the micropolys in the presets folder are made. So what you can do is go down to that micropoly menu, click the image and in the menu, you can alt click any of the micropolys and it's going to create a duplicate sub tool in your sub tool menu. Then you can then preview. So I'm going ahead and clicking the chainmail and duplicating that off. This is useful just to see how micropolys are made, you know, how to get an idea of how you should build one yourself. And so the thing to note is that micropolys are based off a one by one grid. So we can go up to draw and set our grid size to one. And you can see that the micropoly fits that grid perfectly. The edges line up to the edge. And so when our micropoly is on our service, this is making sure that those edges are perfectly lined up to the edges of the grid. And that way they'll merge together when we need them to. So knowing what we know, let's quickly build our own micropoly. I chose to do a simple weave. And so I'm just going to duplicate a couple rectangles and interweave them together so that they kind of create a fabric pattern that we can use. It's very important to keep your edges uniform on their opposite sides because those are going to need to weld together. So when I'm moving pieces around, I'm really making sure to keep those edges where they're at. So I'll often actually mask them just so I don't mistakenly move them without knowing. You also want to make sure that you don't have any end cap polys. So I'm just going to go ahead and delete the faces on the ends to make sure that they're open. Otherwise, they're not going to weld correctly. Now there's two ways to save off a micropoly mesh. We could just make it an insert mesh that we turn into a micropoly when we need to, but you can also navigate to the ZBrush 2021 micropoly folder and save it in there. And when you do that, it'll actually show up in that menu that we were looking at earlier. So if we go back to our micropoly, we can actually see now that Eric knit is in the folder. Now you notice we made a mistake. We didn't merge our sub tools down. And so this is going to be important later on. But first, let's go ahead and merge our two weave pieces together and save that out and fix our micropoly. Now, if we go back and update our micropoly, it should look a lot better. We'll just choose it again. Now we're getting a much better result. However, there's still an issue. If you notice, we have a small gap between two edges of our micropoly, and that's because it wasn't perfectly uniform. So why don't we go ahead and fix that now? Now, if you look closely, you'll notice that the right and left side edges of our micropoly aren't lining up perfectly to that one by one grid. So we need to fix this. What we're going to do is we're going to go down to deformation and we're going to look for an option called uniform. Now, since we just need to unitize it on the X axis, we're going to only enable X and then we're going to hit uniform and it's going to fix the edge of our mesh. 
you can see once we hit unify it snaps that edge to the edge and we're good to go so we can save this out again and update once more and see our results now it's not always going to be perfect because based on your topology and your micropoly it may struggle to merge in some areas and depending on your what you're trying to achieve this may or may not be okay so you can see in some areas we are still struggling but for the most part this did weld okay and it just kind of comes with the territory of micropoly like i said we could try to break it up somehow or we just don't worry about it because a detail like this is going to be so small that a couple areas that aren't welded together you're probably not even going to notice i'm just going to very quickly spend a little bit more time on this shirt to get it looking a little more natural just so we can see how well the micropoly responds to having a lot of curves and wrinkles and just how easy it is to actually modify our micropoly. If at any time you want to convert your micropoly to actual geo, you know, say you want to export it so you can bake it down to a normal map or something like that. All you need to do is in the top of the dynamic subdiv menu, just go ahead and hit apply and it will convert it to actual geometry. Once you do this, it won't be as easy to work with. You won't be able to move it around because once it's geometry, it's no longer driven by that original mesh. It's its own thing now. So keep that in mind and you know, probably save that to the last thing you do if you need to convert it to geo. One more thing I want to show you about making your own micropolys is we can actually create variations of our micropoly that get randomly distributed inside our final mesh. What you can do is actually duplicate subtools in your palette and create variations of your micropoly and it'll distribute those. So I'm going to duplicate it a few times and just move verts around to kind of make it a little different. Now make sure that you keep your edges the same because we don't want to move those edges around. Otherwise, they're not going to weld together properly. So always make sure the edges stay where they are. I'm going to save this off again and then we can update it and see the results. Now, when I update it, if you look closely, you can see that some of them are our new variations. So we've just got a little bit more randomness sprinkled throughout this mesh that just kind of makes it feel a little bit more natural. Now, if you were to export this as geometry that you're going to bake down to like a normal map, I would recommend duplicating your original mesh and maybe deflating it to be just below your micropoly mesh so that you have a solid background. Uh, just in case there's any gaps or holes, this is just going to work a little bit better for you. Uh, and then you can merge those together and export them as your high poly. And that's micropoly in a nutshell. Super powerful and definitely something worth knowing about. Now, the one thing I want to show you very quickly is micro mesh. And I think micro mesh is kind of like the OG Micropoly. It was around before Micropoly was added and they're very similar. The difference being with Micromesh is it only shows up in a render. So you have to go up to render and enable Micromesh preview. And then when you do a BPR render, the Micromesh will show up. You know, if you're just trying to do a ZBrush render, this is a very simple way to work. And I think this could still be useful, but for the most part, I think Micromesh has been replaced with Micropoly. There might still be a use for it outside of just rendering in ZBrush that I don't know about, but yeah, I just wanted to show you that quick. Just a quick note, while I was editing, I decided to do a little bit more research into Micromesh, and I want to make one correction. You actually can convert Micromesh into Geometry if you go up to the Geometry tab and go to Convert BPR to Geo. So you can do a render and then once you do that render, you can actually convert it to geometry and then use that geometry for whatever you need to. I noticed the results are very similar to Micropoly still. So I think in most cases I stand by what I said that Micropoly pretty much has replaced Micromesh. I just wanted to make that clarification that you can actually use it as geometry if you want to. The next thing I want to show you is Nanomesh. Now, Nanomesh and Micropoly have a lot of similarities. You can do pretty much the same thing with them. You can do, you know, chain mail or scales or whatever, but they have their strengths and weaknesses. And so I'm going to show you how Nanomesh is different from Micropoly 
and what you might use each one for. Now, I do think for things like chainmail, micropoly is easier to work with, and I think you'll learn why as we explain nano mesh. However, you can do a lot of really, really cool things with nano mesh that you can't do with micropoly. So you'll notice in our tools menu, there is a nano mesh section, but that nano mesh section is grayed out. And that's because we have to insert a nano mesh through Z modeler. So if you go to your Z modeler brush, hit space bar and choose insert nano mesh, we can actually draw a mesh in there. Now, by default, it's just gonna add a cube, but we can replace that cube later. Or you can hit M on your keyboard and bring up your subtool palette and choose a different subtool to insert as a nano mesh. I'm just gonna go ahead and choose the knit and then I can click on a poly and drag that knit out and scatter the nano mesh on our mesh. Now, since nano mesh is enabled through Z modeler, we can use a lot of Z modeler's tools to benefit us. So poly groups, for example, all dictate where the nano mesh goes. So we could do a poly groups border to insert a nano mesh only on the borders, or we could do just a poly group or a polygroup all. So using polygroups to your advantage is a great way to have nano mesh do what you want it to do. So keep that in mind. Once we've gone ahead and dragged a nano mesh out on our mesh, we can go back to that nano mesh section and you'll see now we have all the settings available to us. You have some quick buttons to fill the polygons with the nano mesh or try to fit them the best it can. You also have a size slider. You can just manually size them up or size them down as you need. You also can adjust the height, the width, the variation, rotations, pretty much any translation value you can modify. There's some alignment rules, so you can choose how to align them along a certain edge or a certain normal. So if you're trying to get a, a certain fit, that might help you kind of align them correctly. And you can already kind of see how they don't fit quite as well as micro poly. It's a little more difficult. You can do it, but it's gonna take some creativity. However, there are some things that NanoMesh does that makes it much more powerful than micro poly in some ways. So one thing you can do is hit edit mesh up in the top here and actually work side by side with your mesh and your nano mesh. And as you make changes to that nano mesh, you'll see it update in real time on your model, which is pretty cool. So you can kind of see how your changes are affecting things. You can also use IMM brushes as nano meshes. So if you go to our IMM brush, drag a brush out, and then see that update on our model. We could also just completely replace our model with an IMM brush. So if I clear my mask and then hit W, I can actually just scroll through the IMM brush catalog and replace it. So if I had like a library of fabric weaves or something that I've made, I could just kind of scroll through those and find one that works for my mesh, which is pretty cool. We're just gonna choose a button as our example. You can see with the deformation how much it's driven by the shape of our polygons. So, you know, you could spend time making sure your quads are really uniform if you're trying to do something very specific that you can't have a lot of distortion on. But for most cases, it's okay to have a little bit of distortion, I think. You can turn any insert mesh brush or just any mesh into a nano mesh brush by going to the brush menu, selecting create, and then going to create nano mesh brush. And that's going to actually spawn off a Z modeler brush in your brush menu that's dedicated to that new nano mesh. So if you just want like a quick set of ways to access nano meshes, you can create custom brushes that help speed that process up. Now, where nano mesh gets really interesting is the tiling and patterns. So you can see we have an H tile and a V tile, and we can set in different numbers to dictate the amount of tiling our nano mesh has in each quad. And then we can scrub through this pattern slider to create different patterns with those nano meshes. Or you can hit the little button on the right next to pattern and actually choose specific presets. Now, for example, we can place all of these buttons in each corner. And I think it's very easy to imagine you could use that for like sci-fi paneling or shit or industrial paneling and have bolts in the corner. So instead of having to hand place those bolts, you can just use nano mesh to quickly place those bolts in the position you want. And as you select through these patterns, there's all kinds of really fancy different patterns you can lay out. So, you know, I could imagine needing like really fancy de detail for like a nightgown or a dress. And you can use nano mesh to get like a pattern of beads or, you know, a little gold detail or something like that. Like a, uh, uh, like an ice skater's dress, like they're really fancy. You could use nano mesh to get some cool results. Another powerful thing nano mesh has is the random distribution. So you can increase the amount of randomization so it doesn't show on every single poly, it shows randomly on your mesh. 
Um, I could I could imagine a situation where like you're doing a terrain and you want to quickly scatter rocks around. You could use nano mesh to do that. Or an example I thought of on this sweater was what if you had little randomized stray hairs or little unwoven bits on a sweater. So I just found a preset that kind of looks like a thread and just scatter that around and make it really small. And it kind of just gives you those tiny little speckles of unevenness and thread. And then, you know, in your model, you kind of get that result and it, I think it works pretty well. So that's just like a quick way to add an extra layer of detail on your model. Similar to Micropoly, if you want to convert this to Geo, you can go up to your geometry tool and at the very top where your subdivisions are, you can click convert BPR to Geo and that'll turn your nano mesh into geometry. Similar to Micropoly, it can get very dense very quickly. So you always want to keep your Micropolys or your nano meshes as optimized as possible because once you have a lot of those on a mesh, even if they're low poly, it's going to add up. So you know, always try to keep things as lightweight as you can. So the last thing I want to show you about nano mesh is you can have multiple nano meshes on your model. So if you go back to your Z modeler and insert another nano mesh, you can click and drag on a quad and then press shift and let go. And it'll create a second layer of nano mesh. And you'll see in our nano mesh menu in the top right, we get access to an index slider. So we can slide that slider around to select the different nano meshes on our model and adjust them. So index zero is our spiky horns and index one is our bolt. So you can swap between those and adjust them as needed. I want to show you one more example of how you can use polygroups to better help achieve what you want to get done with nano mesh. On Crowfall, there was an armor set that used these big scales. And I used nano mesh to kind of quickly place those. And then I was able to go in by hand and adjust them a little bit after. So we're going to kind of explain how I did that model. We have a very simple scale uh, mesh that we're going to use for reference here. And we're going to apply it to this tapered cylinder. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a couple poly groups and I'm going to alternate the poly groups so that we have two sets of groups that swap between each line. We're going to have our blue poly group and our orange poly group. So now what I can do is apply a nano mesh to the one poly group and then a second nano mesh index to the other poly group. So I can control alternating scale rows independently. And that already looks pretty cool. But what this is going to allow us to do is play with these settings to offset every other row. So we kind of have alternating scales and we were able to do that in just like a minute's time. So, you know, super useful, helps you a lot. Um, you know, if we wanted to get even more advanced where the scales on the same row were kind of overlapping each other side by side, we could then create additional poly groups to offset every other one in the same row. So, you know, there's a lot of things you can think about to help kind of guide what you want to do with nano mesh. And lastly, just a quick example of using both Micropoly and Nano Mesh together to kind of get a cool fuzzy sweater. So using the Micropoly to get the thread detail and using Nano Mesh to get those little strays and kind of simulate that effect. I think that about wraps it up. I hope you were able to learn something about Micropoly and Nano Mesh and how to use them. Super powerful tools. I mean, the stuff we can do in 3D has come so far in the past five years. I remember having to do chainmail on characters on Crowfall uh, early on, like 2015, where I was using a script in Maya to unwrap the mesh as its UVs. So it laid flat and then duplicating the chainmail across it and then having to use like a wrap to rewrap that chainmail around the mesh. Like it was so slow, so cumbersome, just took so much effort. And now you can use something like Micropoly to get that result super fast. You know, it's not perfect with some smart tricks and figuring out how to place things. It's so much faster than anything we used to have. So hope you enjoyed that. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing and hitting the thumbs up. I know you hear that all the time, but it does really help small channels like mine. Thank you so much for the support. Don't stop creating and I will see you next time. Take care.